Hello, everybody who's starting to come into the seminar. Um, we're going to be starting shortly. Thank you. Okay, so we're up to, I think, 40 participants, um, and we're expecting quite a few more, so I'm just going to give it another minute or two. Thank you. shuffling around to get a good background. Okay, I make that three pass now. So I think uh, I will make uh, a start. So welcome everybody uh, to this Morris Block seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Luzi and I'm going to be hosting today. I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Professor Karen Shankland, uh, who's going to present on being productive and staying well. Uh, now I've spoken to a few people who have uh, heard Prof Shankland uh, present and I know uh, we're, we're in for a great session here. Uh, I think the, the numbers that are coming through in the Zoom audience will speak to themselves in terms of the quality of the presenter and the, the importance of this topic. So a little about our speaker today. Um, Karen is a professor in computing science at University of Stirling. Um, and she does teaching and both undergraduate uh, programming languages and interface design, a lot of pastoral care, um, and leadership in terms of learning and teaching. And bu bureaucracy is mentioned. Um, uh, we, we don't know about that here, do we? Um, and right now, <laughs> uh, not much research, um, Karen says. Um, Karen's passionate about in inclusion in computing and is building a divert, a good practice network of computing and uh, electronic engineering departments. She's won awards. Uh, she won the 2017 Scottish Women's Award for Services to Science and Technology and the 2016 Suffrage Science Award. So in the talk today, Karen has kindly agreed to give good time uh, at the end for, for discussion. And the actual presentation itself is kind of split into two. Uh, so in the first part, uh, uh, she's not gonna field questions, but in the second part, she may invite to ask some questions. Um, and for questioning, please use the uh, Q&A box and I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and I'll, uh, I will present the questions to Karen. Um, so without further ado, I think I will invite Karen to start her presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, it, it's lovely to be with you today. Um, webinars are slightly odd because you don't entirely know who the audience are on the other side. So I'm just gonna trust the number um, and uh, hope that you're all sitting comfortably with your um, cup of tea or um, possibly your sandwiches. Um, this is very much a personal talk um, in the first half. Um, and I think the times at the moment are really challenging. Um, <laughs> Things were really challenging in 2019, okay? And then in 2020, everything went completely nuts. And we, what we thought was challenging before to be a stroll in the park. Um, and in the last couple of years, uh, workloads have gone through the roof. Um, and uh, I think we're all struggling to just keep going and to deliver um, the next thing that's due. 
um, and not necessarily stopping to think about uh, the, the wider pictures. Um, I'm slightly aware that uh, some of this talk might make it sound like I have all the right answers, and I really don't. Um, so I, I'm just going to share some thoughts that I have, um, and I very much welcome uh, some interaction with you at the end, because um, I think hopefully we'll all have a lot to learn from each other. Um, so uh, I should also say that uh, I'm going to talk quite frankly um, here about my own mental difficulties. Um, some people may find that upsetting. Um, I'm going to find it upsetting, probably. Um, it's okay. I do this talk quite a lot and I know that's what comes. Um, I, I think it's useful to be able to, as, as a, a more senior member of the community, to be able to stand up and say, uh, actually things, things are not perfect. Um, because I think it's, if it's difficult for me to do it, just a personal level, um, I think it's nearly impossible to do it if you're a junior member of staff. Um, because there are so many other pressures um, and uh, demands to look as if everything's okay. Okay, so um, I think I have a responsibility to be open. Um, if you want to stop listening when it gets to the really um, upsetting stuff, then no judgment here. Okay, and apologies for the typo on the first slide. That is correct for you. I know it's Morris Bloch, but obviously PowerPoint doesn't know that it's Morris Bloch. Okay, so um, I wanted to set the scene about mental health in academia a little bit more generally. Um, and obviously, uh, the, the things that I've got um, are actually a, a little bit old now um, and they're from well before the pandemic. But I can only imagine that after the pandemic, everything got much worse, right? So even before the pan pandemic, in 2016, in fact, um, there were some reports that came out about how stressed and overworked um, uh, academ academics were um, in, in particular. So 55% of all UK academics have suffered stress-related mental health problems. Um, and you might think, well, okay, is that is that a normal number? Um, but if you compare it to other staff groups like NHS staff, I mean, you would have thought that the NHS would be quite stressed, the police would be quite stressed. But even in 2016, we were more stressed than all of those groups. Um, and it's not just academics, it's also professional services staff. So there was a good start survey in 2018 run by the Times Higher Education uh, magazine and 87% of them said that the work negatively impacts their mental health. And you're like, well, that's just not, can't be right. We, we shouldn't be working in jobs where basically nearly everybody says this work um, negatively impacts my mental health. Um, uh, work spills into the weekend um, and that's been true for academics for a long time. Um, it's increasingly true for professional services staff. Again, that's, that's not right because we need downtime. We need to be able to refresh and restore. Um, and, and we probably all know why these things are happening. So um, increased workloads, um, the role that you have taken on has become bigger and bigger and bigger. I know that certainly um, so I've just uh, celebrated 25 years at Stirling. Um, the kinds of things that I do now at, as uh, an academic are vastly expanded. And it's not just because um, I'm a professor now, but it's also just because we're all expected to do lots of extra things with the outreach and um, more, ad more admin than I could possibly enumerate, right? I mean, it just drives me crazy. Um, but also more junior staff, they have to deal with precarious contracts. Um, we all have to deal with a terrible audit culture. Um, we are, in, in some ways, we're our own worst enemies. Um, that We try to comply with those audits um, to the best of our ability or possibly even better. Um, and that makes life, why don't you just give yourself a bigger stick to help yourself with, right? I mean, this is what we do all the time. Um, and of course, metrics. Um, there was a terrific report called Pressure Vessels, um, and I'll put a reference to that at the end. Um, and it, it talks about, you know, all of these issues. <clears throat> okay, so uh, it's not just us, it's also students. Um, and uh, 
So if, if one in four students are suffering from depression and anxiety, and again, that's a slightly out of date statistic, um, but importantly, our stress and well-being also impacts on that of our students. Um, and of course, there's a weird um, circular connection here as well, because uh, many of you will probably be having more stress because of the things that you have to do in order to deal with student stress, right? So when we feel more stressed, that possibly makes our own students more stressed. Um, and, and so the cycle just amps itself up. Um, so if it's not enough yourself, and then I, I, maybe I'm the only one here, I, I find it really difficult to prioritise myself. Um, then at least you can think about your colleagues and you can think about um, your students and how improving your mental health might also help those other people. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of very high level background. Um, there, there's a lot of mental health problems around. What I wanted to talk about uh, my, my personal story was just to be open about the fact that I've had mental health problems. Um, and I was quite prejudiced about mental health, I think, before it happened to me, um, before I recognised that it happened to me, um, because I, I certainly feel that in academia, there's a bit of a, um, a, a tough image you know that you you have to be um, sort of strong and capable and getting on with a job and uh, it, you shouldn't show any signs of weakness because you know that just you're probably not cut out for academia right um, you can't hack it um, and I I totally had all of that internalized myself um, and uh, now that I've seen the light I would like to help other people see the light as well you may already be more enlightened um, so. I'm a professor at Stirling, um, in fact, slightly more than 25 years now, um, 25 years and three weeks. Um, I teach cross, as Jim said, um, but I do all the, the things that we're supposed to do, right? I apply for research grants, um, I write papers, um, although I have not touched a paper in the last 18 months because no time. Um, I've seen leadership roles, I've been head of division, um, I, um, have had roles for Athena Swan in the university. I've been on academic council and court and all these sorts of things. Um, I've won some awards um, as a, a woman in a science subject. Um, I am managed to balance that up with, maybe you not know, balance is the word, uh, I actually do have a stable family life as well. I'm in a relationship, I have been for quite a long time. I have a nice house, I live in a nice area. Um, in Glasgow, I live in Bears Den. It's a very nice area. Um, lots of trees, very charming people. Um, I have other interests as well. So um, I wasn't entirely the kind of academic who just did their subject. Um, I'm a very keen amateur musician, not during the pandemic, but it's starting to come back. Um, extremely keen gardener. We spend a lot of time in our garden um, growing vegetables and all that healthy stuff. Um, my partner loves to go canoeing. I think I'm going to die and drow basically drown and die, but you know, it, it can be very peaceful as well. Um, I'm getting better at it. I'm more confident. Um, and I would love to be a keen hill walker. I used to be a keen hill walker when I was in my 20s. Um, there are too many things to do, right? I don't have the time to do everything. So that one is kind of slid by the way. So I think if I presented my CV to you, you would think that I am probably one of the more overachieving kind of academics who has got life completely sorted um, and never has any problems. And um, yeah, uh, this is not the case. Um, so I think, The success that I've had traits. So um, I'm smart. Um, 
I would hope I'm an academic. Um, I am hopefully reliable. I can do, I kind of, um, I'm, I'm good at, if you give me a task to do, then I will absolutely do that to the best of my ability. Um, I am a little bit too hung up on fulfilling the expectations of other people. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from, you know, when I was a kid, I was the one that liked to get the teacher for doing things. I, I have a theory that a lot of people in academia are, are that person. They like to get that kind of approval. That's how we got to where we are. But sometimes those traits can work against us. Um, and it can be really exhausting to, to live up to all of those good qualities. Um, so, uh, say a, a bit, bit more about uh, the things that I do. Um, that's, that's my kind of well-rounded academic idea. Um, thinking about that in a bit more detail, um, I would say uh, in 2016, I had really been um, aiming for promotion for a while at that point um, and engaging in more activities that I thought would get me promoted. And I was right, they did get me promoted. Um, so I was promoted to professor in 2014. Um, and the trouble is that once you get promoted, uh, people ask you to do more things. Um, and so you can't switch it off and you can't switch off the, the um, personal mechanisms that led you to that success in the first place. So what I found was that all of those jobs that I was doing just got bigger. Um, and I took on more additional activities. So um, I'm not going to enumerate all these, but it's just to give you a flavour of the sorts of things that I was doing that were to do with leadership, that were to do with um, being out in the, the scientific community, but being out also in the um, the broader community to, to communicate about science because we're all encouraged to do that but also doing the things of teaching and running a um, research group um, uh, and of course as a woman in science then I get totally fingered for doing um, the equalities work because it's clearly the job of women to sort the problem that there aren't enough women in science um, you may not have that uh, view uh, at, uh, you might not have that evidence the Institute of Health and Wellbeing, but um, that is the, the kind of thing that you see an awful lot, that the people who are sorting problems are the people who have come through those problems themselves. Um, so, too many jobs. Um, and still thinking about those uh, abilities that I have, um, that kind of started to turn against me, that needing to be seen as reliable and competent meant that I couldn't afford to be seen as weak and I couldn't afford to be I couldn't afford to be the person that said no to a job um in my head um and I think collegiality is really important I'm sick of academics who only do one thing and it's typically research um that they, they choose to focus on um, and I'm sure we've all had colleagues who um, don't do admin well or don't do teaching well and therefore, uh, but because the research is so important, they get to focus on that research. Um, but the, thing, the trouble is that in universities, many universities don't really value teaching and they don't really value the uh, admin and the leadership that makes the university run effectively. Um, so there's disproportionate reward for being a good researcher compared to being um, a good teacher. That's getting a bit better now. Um, uh, I was always willing to take on new roles, interested in new stuff. I mean, it's always appealing. Um, and uh, because I'm a scientist, perhaps, um, some of my personality traits are I'm very methodical, uh, thorough and persistent. So I will really keep plugging through a job um, to get to the end of it. Um, and I'll also keep plugging through a really bad situation in the belief that 
well, I'm going to be really busy for the next couple of weeks, but then it's going to be better. Um, or, you know, the next month and then it's going to be better or the next six months and then it's going to be better. Um, I was kind of wrong about that. So um, what I, I developed was um, what one of my friends called the carapace of efficiency, um, which I thought was a very uh, descriptive way of looking at things that I was so bound up in uh, my sort of perfectionism and obeying the rules and pleasing other people and meeting those lots of deadlines and taking on more tasks than I really had time for, um, for a multitude of reasons, and we'll talk about them a bit more in the, the second half of the talk, um, I, that I found myself constrained into like super rigid timetabling to make sure that I had, um, that I could do these jobs. And especially what it meant was I didn't really have any time for people. Um, and especially I didn't have time for uh, my music. I didn't have time for my partner. And I kind of excused that to myself. I kind of, well, if I can maybe think about um, a particular story. Um, so I said already, I work in Bears, uh, I work in Stirling, but I live in Bears Den. Usually I travel by train. Uh, my kind of routine was that on the train home, I would work. Um, and on my walk from the station back to the house, about 10 minutes, um, I would plan out all of the things that I hadn't yet completed for that day that I needed to finish that evening. Right. And so I'd be, you know, listing these on my fingers as I go up the hill. And uh, my partner teaches violin and viola at home, so she teaches in the evening. And I remember really clearly one night walking up that hill and thinking of the things I really needed to do um, in the evening and then remembering that it was the school holidays and that therefore my partner wouldn't be teaching and that therefore I would have to spend time with her instead of spending time with my to-do list. Um, and I really remember the kind of guilt that was associated with that because I, I felt permanently guilty that I wasn't working enough, but I also felt permanently guilty that I wasn't being enough of Karen Shankland, you know, that wasn't fulfilling the personal side of my life. I wasn't pulling my weight when it came to um, household chores um, and I, I wasn't spending enough time with my partner who, you know, I love very much and who entertains me massively. Um, we are together for a reason, but I had allowed the, the tasks that I built up to, to take priority. Um, and you felt rotten, actually. It just, it just felt horrible. And I knew it felt horrible, but I kept ignoring the fact that it felt horrible because if I could just get through the next couple of weeks, it would all be fine. Um, I, I was also getting uh, signals from my body to tell me that it was happy, that it was overstressed. Uh, but I was really good at ignoring those. Um, and even, <laughs> I, I feel slightly embarrassed to say this, um, I went through a phase where um, I started coming out in uh, like a giant heat rash before I had an important meeting. And you'd think that I would go, oh, maybe this is really important. Maybe this is, I should pay attention to this because maybe it's the meeting that's causing stress and this is why I'm coming out in spots. Um, but no, I, I didn't think about that. Um, I just ignored it and hoped it would go away. And it kind of did. I think my body just got used to the additional levels of cortisol for a while. Um, well, uh, two other things I want to say about this uh, were, that I am also of a certain age. So uh, the time that this was kicked off, I guess I was late forties. Um, so I was perimenopause. Um, I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, you know, I kind of had the classic hot flushes idea. Um, I knew that your period stopped and you had hot flushes. I didn't really know if the other things that were going on for me were related to 
menopause and, and if I could do anything about them um, because I I'd, I'd started feeling quite anxious um, and perhaps that that need to please other people was also coming out of that place I don't know um, but you know again talk about that quite as much as we could um, and also uh, I could say that uh, I ha had a late diagnosis of an autism spectrum condition um, in 2017 um, so that was that was after I had a bit of a uh, meltdown basically um, and of course I'd been autistic all of that time but hadn't really uh, added together all of those things, like I told you about being methodical and thorough and persistent, um, you know, that, that's totally there with um, an autistic diagnosis. I kind of didn't think about the fact that I was a woman in a computer science department and I knew people who presented more autistically. So I never really thought that I was along that end of the spectrum. I kind of thought I was along the more neurotypical end of the spectrum, but I'm just more neurotypical for computer scientists making a massive generalisation. Um, that also uh, played into the stresses that I was feeling. Okay, so what can I tell you? It was it was a, it was a bad time, um, and I probably I probably struggled through that about for four years. Probably, I was probably really stressed and really overworked, and actually depressed for four years, um, without acknowledging that those things were happening trying to pretend like it was all okay if i just could get through my to-do list then everything would be fine um so i wanted to put here some of the uh the symptoms of depression i think maybe it would have helped me at that time to have looked at that list you know done the depression questionnaire and to you know scored highly on the depression questionnaire and realized that maybe yeah that there was something here this wasn't just in my head um that there was actually it was it wasn't about adding more work so yeah all of these things i was often upset and tearful um i was extremely anxious and worried all the time because i had such a big to-do list that i could not cope with it i was super tired um mainly well, I thought because I was going up early to travel to Stirling, you know, other reasons, I think. I was crabby, like super crabby. Um, and of course, that irritability often gets taken out on the people that are closest to you. So I was not nice to my partner. Um, I was quite frustrated by a lot of things as well. There is a lot to be frustrated about, in fairness, in universities. But um, and possibly out of proportion. Um, I think I, I probably, one of my light bulb moments a little bit was that I was really irritable with students and I was, I had always managed to be calm and patient with students. Um, but I started getting really snappy with students as well. And I thought, uh, that's, that's, that's getting out of control now. Um, I, I felt really worthless. I still actually sometimes feel really worthless um, because there's that sense that I'm not coping. I'm really not coping. I can't tell anybody because I'm supposed to be a professor. Uh, yeah, so I felt isolated. I felt like I was the only person in the world that felt this. And what was even worse, though, all of those things was coming together and I couldn't and I couldn't concentrate, which meant I couldn't get through my to-do list anyway because I didn't have the cognitive abilities. So if I had taken the time to sort that out, maybe I could have actually done my job better, but I couldn't afford to acknowledge that because I was too scared. Okay, so I have some better stuff, which is how I get support. And I think this is the important part. So my partner was super. I'm very lucky that my partner is uh, is good at reading people. Um, and she pushed me and pushed me and pushed me so hard to try and recognise that I had a problem. It took a very long time, it, like four years. Um, but it was important that she supported me. Um, 
And I thought then I could deal with it on my own and for counselling. Um, and I talked to my GP um, and I talked to occupational health. At the and I thought I kind of had a, a handle on it. I thought it would be okay. Um, I did that totally classic thing that when I went to see the GP who said that I was depressed um, and she said, I can sing you off. Um, and I said, no, I can't do that. Can't, I can't be signed off because I've got too much to do. Um, which you know, it's, it's the wrong answer. If your GP says you should be signed off, then you should probably pay attention. Um, for me, the uh, turning point was our departmental secretaries, right? Which is why I would, well, there are many reasons to say that professional services are amazing. Um, and they are our kids, but this is a, an extra special one for ours. So I had, I thought I'd been doing a very good job at hiding all of this from my colleagues. And one day when I came in, uh, I'd had a very bad row with my partner in the morning because she was trying to me to understand what was going on. And I was very resistant. I'd spent most of the train journey crying. But when I got to the university, you know, I went to the toilet, I dried my eyes, I kind of pulled myself together and I walked into the office and they said, how are you? And I totally lost it. I couldn't, couldn't keep that face anymore. And they were amazing. They were just, because I, I guess I thought that something really bad would happen if I admitted the weakness. But actually, they were really nice and they were really supportive. And uh, your senior secretary is very important. So when my senior secretary said to me, how come you aren't signed off? I was like, oh, I told the doctor that I didn't want to be signed off. And she's get back on the phone to the doctor right now. And so I did, I did that day, I went, I went back to the doctor and got signed off. But I only got signed off because Grace told me to. You have to pay attention to Grace, uh, who is our chief secretary. Uh, to them, that made everything else much easier. So I could then take the step to talk to family and friends. I mean, my best friend, I hadn't told her any of this stuff. Um, and then I started doing these sorts of talks. I, I gave this talk to my colleagues in my own department. It was awful. It was, that was, I mean, if you think I'm emotional now, be emotional. Um, but I also give this talk very regularly to um, Aurora people. Um, and I know that some of you in the audience have, have been on the Aurora programme um, and have done International Women's Day talks and public lectures. Um, and you know what I've discovered? Actually, the more you talk about this stuff, the easier it gets. Um, and that it's incredibly rewarding to talk about this as well, because, um, I mean, you, you're kind of, you're slightly being my therapy right now. But also, I, I hope that I'm, by being this open, then that will help. If any of you are in that place where I was five, six years ago, and in that phase where you're kind of denying that there's a problem, hopefully you learn something from my story that I did not learn from myself at that time. Because I never thought it was going to happen to me. I thought I was strong and competent and reliable. Okay, so but moving on. Um, it probably took me a while to get over all of that. Um, and I would say by about 2019, then I, I think things were better. Um, I still have all of those, those um, personal traits. Um, I'm slightly better at reining it in, but only slightly. Um, I I'm still can do, but I try not to say, take on too many things. Um, and I guess, you know, things that I've learned is I do have to look after myself. And even though I don't really like that, 
it, it's an inescapable fact um, that that talking is really necessary. Um, and uh, this one I really struggle with. I struggle with be kind to yourself, right? Because I find it really difficult to be kind to myself. But I find it easy to be kind to other people. So if we can all be a bit more kind to each other, then actually we should all benefit. Uh, and if you haven't come across uh, Scientists Are Human, then uh, this is a lovely, it's a Twitter account, but also uh, there's, there's a web page uh, around the organisation. And their manifesto is about being more kind in science. So it's a, it's a really worthwhile uh, thing. There's some stories and things there of, you know, personal stories of uh, what people are celebrating or struggling with in, in science. And focusing on that side of the human side of being a scientist, um, which I think can sometimes be a problem. Okay, and I picked 2019 as well for a particular reason, because that was before all of the world changed. Um, because actually in the last few years, it's been really difficult to say no to things because you just have to get on with it. You know, your course needs to be online. That has to happen. There's no two ways about it. So how do we help ourselves and how do we help each other a little bit more? Um, this, this comes from a talk I did with my friend Rachel Norman. Um, so she really deserves the credit for the second half of the talk. Um, and uh, None of it, I don't think any of it's, none of it's new. It's all called from other sources, but it's just, um, I'm going to present these things rather more quickly um, and they will get to the discussion. So um, these are the things that I was going to focus on. But there are elements where you can uh, help yourself. And these are motivation and focus measuring your progress, uh, deciding when you're good enough, I'm rubbish at that, uh, deciding what your boundaries are, I'm not very good at that either, and saying no, and I'm really terrible at saying no. Um, so I totally, I'm sitting here saying, I know what I'm meant to do, and I know what's good for you. I'm not saying I can do all of these things all the time because I'm not that perfect person. Okay, so I think it's really, uh, you know, uh, if we do the thing that we love, then that will give us the drive and the focus. And I think that's why a lot of us do push through the situations that we're in, because we have that motivation. So, um, you know, there are ways you can think about, A, what are your goals in the first place? Uh, what is it makes you happy in life? And are you doing that thing? Uh, are you doing enough of that thing, right? Because we all have to do things that we don't really uh, want to do and that aren't entirely in keeping with our goals but can you make sure that you're doing something that fits with your goals particularly uh, for us working in institutions um, can we align ourselves in some way with institutional goals and that will make life easier all around ah progress is a difficult one because you can spend the whole day answering your email and at the end of the day you still have a massively full email inbox um, and it will not feel like progress and moreover the more answers you make the more email you get back in response right so you've just made the problem worse for yourself as well so having that pause to say where how do I what I've done um, and how do I measure my progress for yourself and not against other people um, because that that thing of uh, you know you measure your insides by other people's outsides and of course other people's outsides always look shiny and glossy um, and your eyes well my insides look like horrible um, so um, I'm never going to uh, measure up to that shiny and glossy thing um, so try and think about the things that you've achieved at the end of the day it sounds really corny uh, I do be good enough. I think that's a really difficult one because if we knew where that point was when what you'd done was good enough and you didn't really have to put any extra effort in, then we would stop early, wouldn't we? But um, it's really difficult 
I think we're in a culture of constantly polishing things and making them better and better and better, whether it's grants or papers or teaching or even the forms you have to fill in for some you, you tracking thing. Um, you know, how do we know when good enough is okay? Um, so more careful about your time can help with that to say, I have a colleague who used to be brilliant at saying, I have 20 minutes to do this job. This job will therefore take 20 minutes. Um, and sometimes he did a terrible job, right? In the 20 minutes, but it was done. Whereas I'm much more, uh, I'm going to do this job for as long as it takes me to do this job. And then I get rest about all the other things I have to do. Uh, boundaries are really difficult. I think boundaries are even more difficult now um, that we do much more online. Um, but actually, you are in, in control of these things. Uh, for most of us, I think, nobody is saying you must be on your email or you must be on uh, the, the VLE or whatever it is. 24 seven, nobody is saying that. Um, but because we can be, we often are. And because other people work different patterns, then it can feel like we're all on there 24 seven. So if it helps you to say, I'm only gonna answer emails in the morning, I'm only gonna look at emails once a day. Um, as long as you're clear about what your communication boundaries are with other people, then, uh, we work in a profession where that should be okay and it is okay um, but it can just be hard to to set that boundary mm, saying no also rubbish should say no um so much so has given me a badge that says no on it um this is the badge um because i, I don't say no to enough things um and of course there are clearly at saying yes to too many things because we have too many things to do. Um, and maybe we can turn that around. So often we say we, we won't say no to things because we're scared of missing out, fear of missing out. Um, and so you can see a great opportunity to build something on your CV or do something that's important. Um, but the, the work-life balance thing is a less um, outcome so it's it's hard to to see how you balance those things up and you know I can hear a lot of my colleagues saying oh I could just fit this in um it will just take me you know a couple of days it's only a short time you know all of these are distractions from really trying to balance up your goals and your health and happiness against another thing on your CV especially if you're trying to get promoted Sometimes we're worried about letting other people down. Um, I, and I think that partly comes back to, we all like to feel a bit special. So, you know, if you have been invited to uh, review something or to take part in a special um, event that's, you know, only certain people are invited to or whatever, even if it's a, you know, a, your head of department invites you to be the person that takes charge of seminars, you think, well, um, you know, I, I'm sort of doing that person a favour by saying yes. Um, but we're also kind of assuming that we're the only person who can help with this. And actually, um, I think this is a good trick. That if you, if you imagine that you are, you know, the fifth person to have been asked to do this job, I think that makes it much easier to say no and move on to somebody else. Um, whereas if you feel like you're the, the top you know, if you have that I feel special thing, then uh, that makes you much more likely to to come to that flattery. Um, and also, if you say no, somebody else has the opportunity to do it. Um, and that might be uh, more beneficial for their career than it would be beneficial for your career. Um, so it's all about prioritising your strategic goals. So I think what, what I wanted to sort of finish was really to say with these uh, take home messages that are a lot in our lives that we can't actually control. So we, we can only really think about the things that we can control. So you can control how you think about your work um, and you can control the 
have knowledge of the things that make you happy um, and, and satisfied with your job, more of those things and less of the other things. Um, uh, we should have realistic goals. We don't have realistic goals, of course we don't, but you know, try and set more realistic goals. Um, and absolutely acknowledge and celebrate those achievements. So often the, the achievement part comes a bit too long after the work, you know? So I'm thinking about if you're writing a paper, so you submit the paper and then three months later, you get uh, a notification of hopefully that it's been accepted. Um, but by that time, somehow three, that was that was the paper of three months ago. Um, and so you can't really quite celebrate that as much as you might have if you had known it instantly. Um, at the moment when you'd just done all the work for that paper, because you've already moved on. So it to take a pause and just stop um, and uh, celebrate those things. Um, I've got a, a couple of more slides. I'll just, I'll move on to the references. A couple of books, I think really brilliant. Um, Susan's book about depression, amazing. Uh, Thin Slices of Anxiety, good because it's got lots of cartoons, so you don't have to really read anything. Um, but those cartoons really capture key elements about being anxious or being depressed and can use humour to cut through, you know, they're like, oh, I am totally like that person. Um, and I, I, I would give some uh, notes of the uh, the references that I used earlier on. So the press is a happy report. Um, and uh, yeah, those surveys that I mentioned. Okay, I'm going to stop now and uh, turn it over to, to Jim. I'm very happy to take questions on anything. Um, I, yeah, I, I'll talk about anything. I just didn't want to interrupt the first half. Uh, thank you, Karen, for uh, a fantastic uh, presentation and uh, for being so open and and Frank uh, with us. Um, as uh, Karen says, that's uh, now open to questions. Um, and we're starting to get some through in the Q&A. So um, Karen, I hope you can see the Q&A. Um, we've got some a reflection here from someone, I haven't left a name. Uh, I've been present when I should have been absent. I was waiting for someone to say, go home and stay home until you're better. It seems important to train our managers to recognize the signs that someone is mentally very poorly and should be at home. How could we take this forward, do you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that uh, that's absolutely true. And in some ways, when I give these sorts of uh, talks to a wider off audience, it's more often than not to people who are more junior than me. Um, and they're the ones that potentially experience problems. Um, so I think you're right. I think we do need to train managers. Um, and I, uh, if if anybody wanted to invite me to talk to a bunch of managers about this stuff and to be this open with managers, I would totally do it. Um, and I've got a session lined up with um, Advanced HE to talk to some more uh, senior managers about that. Um, but yes, I think we all need uh, that training in universities um, generally just to, I'm not even sure if it's about recognizing mental illnesses. I think that's true, but actually we could just be kinder to each other um, in general, because I think you're right that we do often hide it really, really well. And I don't know if, if at the time when I was at my worst, at my lowest, if anybody had said to me, how are you doing, you know, are you coping? It looks like you should go home or, or stop doing these extra things. I would have been incandescent with rage, right? Um, because I was not always in a place to hear that. Um, so, yeah, I think train, training for managers, um, but training for each other. I, I'm going to go training for each other because actually that, you know, your, your office mate 
the person in the office next door. Um, the, as I said, the secretaries, the secretaries were the one that really helped me. Um, you know, it, it could be anybody, just if we all feel like it's okay to, to ask how things are going and to really listen to the answer. You know, because so many times you walk past somebody in the corridor and there's a kind of instantaneous exchange of, how are you? I'm fine, I'm really busy. And then you both walk off and neither of you have really actually communicated. Thank, thank you, Karen. Um, message from Kate O'Donnell. Uh, that was very powerful, thank you. Um, so Kate is mentioning the PDR paperwork. So you'll, you'll have something system uh, similar in Sterling performance and development review. So I've okay. been doing a couple of those today as well. Uh, Kate notes a system designed to make you feel you haven't done enough. Um, so you talked a lot about what you've tried to change in yourself. What do we do to change these kind of performance systems to, yeah. to better support us? Yeah, all, also a very good question. I am. Um, I think that's right. I think my my talk focuses on what you because you can actually do that. Um, I think I would like to think that uh, through activities like Athena Swan um, and Aurora, then we are moving the the system a little bit more in terms of providing support. But I completely agree that um, things like PDR still are designed to make you feel like you haven't done enough. Um, but I think, you know, so from what I hear from colleagues at Glasgow, I think you've got a much better um, balance of reward, for example, for teaching uh, recognition and reward for um, teaching and admin as, as well as research. So I think, you know, things are moving, but it's slow. Thank you. Um, let me get to the next question here. Uh... Thank you for not forgetting about professional services staff. You are setting a great example of valuing all colleagues, whatever their role and um, wherever they fit into the hierarchy. Um, please let everyone who's attended today follow your lead in this and so many other ways. So more comment there. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> uh, from Nicola, um, from one oh, period <laughs> menopausal bears day and resident to another. Thank you for your fascinating talk. Um, I've been through similar myself with a major health scare. It takes time to learn to be kind to yourself and be happy with good enough. Uh, so in, a, in our institute, we have mental health first aiders, but I don't know how busy uh, they are. I don't know, have you got something similar set up in Sterling? We don't actually. Um, yeah, I've heard of a few places that have this. I'd be really interested to know, actually, from, from your side, how well that is working. Thank you. Um, I'm just going down. I hope I'm not missing any here. From Tracy. Um, I opted out of the academic field to avoid stress and had help from the union and, and great head of department. Uh -huh. Did the union help you at all? Um, so did the University College Union, were they, were they involved, Karen, uh, when you, in your difficult time? Um, I didn't go to them, actually. Um, but you're right, I, I perhaps, I, I, I certainly could have, um, and perhaps I should have. Um, I had enough support, I think, certainly from my head of department I think he, he was really helpful and um, from occupational health um, so that was really useful um, and you know I had the, the time off um, partly because I was signed off by the doctor um, but also because I had research leave immediately after that that slightly precipitated the problem um, but also it meant that I had a bit of space to to recover from it as well. Although it meant that I'd get the things done in my research leave that I really should have got done. I got myself fixed a bit better. Um, but yeah, absolutely, UCU can really help. Thank you. Um, from Lisa here, uh, I love hearing you speak, Karen. It always resonates so much. 
Um, thank you for your honesty and kindness. How do we balance or accept saying no uh, to opportunities without losing all the opportunities that might be necessary for us to progress? Oh, I hope Karen's still with us. Yeah. <laughs> That's magic. Um, you, yeah. ju you just have to, yeah. I know if you're presented with 10 different things, um, then how do you know the one that's going to be most beneficial for you? You don't. So pick the one that you feel happy about. Pick the one that makes you feel happiness. Because actually, how much does the progression really matter? You know, so if we had more of a, a focus on our own growth, um, maybe that would be more useful. I certainly done some things which I think did help me progress in the sense that I think probably did con contribute to my promotion. Um, I think if I went, if I could go back, Oh, that's a tricky one. If I could go back, would I do that again? Um, I'm. I probably would actually do these things again. You know, not, not so much because it would lead to promotion, although that's nice, but because I certainly have learned a lot about myself in the last few years, um, because of the stress that some of those things put me under. Um, but yeah, so so always pick the thing that you you love. Thank you. Um, next question is from Paulina. Um, I often find being from the US that this overworking of yourself and not discussing burnout or stress is part of the culture. Do you think it's possible to change people's mindset when it's so deeply rooted in the culture and background of a society? Yeah. <sighs> You are asking some really tough questions. Um, absolutely, it, this is a it's it's about the culture. Um, I think it is possible to change mindsets. I mean, look at the change that we've seen in the last year and a half. You know, we've we've gone uh, so rapidly through many changes as a result of the pandemic. Um, that when people have enough pressure to do something, then they, they do do it. Um, but I think you're right. We, we have, uh, in the UK and in the US, uh, a real, really strong culture of long hours and presenteeism and overworking in order to achieve. Um, and I think uh, else has asked a question about boundaries. Um, and uh, uh, there was another one about uh, people who are not necessarily kind to you um, and how you deal with them. Um, so, I mean, because we don't have a magic wand, can't just change this overnight. And in fact, even if, you know, your um, boss at Glasgow University uh, could suddenly wave a magic wand to say, you must all only work seven and a half hours a day. Um, and I have a magic way of enforcing this. Would you actually, I don't know that you could actually do it. Um, so um, I think it has, it has to be a grassroots movement, um, but maybe we can make it a bit of a pincer. So as I said before, working at the, the bottom level to change minds through uh, conversations like this um, and coming in at the top level to try and uh, generate more of that kindness in the system so that we're not constantly being measured all the time. Thanks. I, I think the next question, you've addressed some of this about the boundaries. Um, uh, the anonymous, anonymous also says, um, I feel that being in academia, no one sort of actually tells you at the start about what, <laughs> what are the expectations. Um, and then it becomes difficult to decide what to do and what not to do. Um, 
so the question is, is there a way to learn these kind of things as a junior researcher? Um, or is it all about privately ta talking to senior colleagues or I guess mentors? Yeah. I certainly would recommend talking to mentors, um, but of course all you'll ever get is their view through that. Uh, and, uh, and also things change. So I think that the, the things that my junior colleagues are having to do now to be seen to be successful um, seem far in excess of the things that I had to do as a, a junior lecturer to be successful. Uh, because the, just the diversity of tasks that they have to engage in now. Um, and I think we need more of that recognition that it's okay to say, I'm good at this thing, I'm going to focus on this thing. But as long as we have a more equitable culture of recognition and reward, so that, uh, and, and that everybody gets to choose the thing that they're good at, right? Because we can't all say, well, I'd rather do research because some of us have to do teaching or vice versa. Okay, we can't all do teaching and nobody does research. Um, so I think things like the Aurora programme really help. Um, for women. Um, uh, th there are similar uh, courses for men as well. So uh, the Advanced HE run, I think it's called the Springboard Programme. Um, so the, yeah, again, a lot of it is it's talking to each other more. Um, if, if sometimes it feels like we should be, we should rise up like, you know, the rebellious masses to say, no, we're not doing that. We, we're, we're done with the extra stuff. Um, because it's really hard as an individual to say that this thing is too much, you know, because we, we're all willing to take on extra stuff. And we all see the need for institution as well. And if not you that takes on that job, who else does it? Because actually everybody's really busy. Um, so... Yeah, maybe we all need to collectively lower our expectations about what we work and what we achieve to something realistic. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I think I've, well, together we've captured all the questions coming through in the Q&A. Um, uh, a few things have come through in the chat, just that they're not questions, but just to a few people saying thanks for sharing your experience. What a superb speaker you are. Um, and someone recommending Aurora to, uh, if people have the opportunity. And again, thank you so much, Karen. Um, so unless, unless uh, people have a last burning question, we are a few minutes past 2 p.m. now, then I will just... Uh, take this opportunity to thanks again uh, our superb speaker today uh, this Morris Block seminar uh, Karen Shankland and um, I will ask people to to um, respond if they can via the, the virtual means to thank Sharon very much for a, a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much it was it was really uh, I really enjoy talks and your questions are all amazing um i hope if you find the answers then let me know um i help well thanks thanks very much karen i'm going to close the meeting now plenty of thanks are coming through on the chat so very much appreciated talk and uh, thanks for your thanks for your time bye-bye